Hello and welcome back to my channel. What if Deku Tuo? Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off part two of our series. What if Deku unleashed godlike powers and surpassed all? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Drip Beelis from Fanfiction Net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Izuku stared up at the massive wanted door in front of him. Just like at the entrance exam, standing inside UA as an official student felt surreal to him, despite the fact that being there wasn't anything new to him at all. He'd get over it at some point, but for the moment, he'd enjoy the ride. Opening the giant door, he let his brain run wild with the possibilities of what he'd encounter when he stepped inside. What would his classmates be like? Who would be his homeroom teacher? Was All Might actually teaching at UA? And, if so, why didn't Nezu tell him? Would the school year prove to be an exciting one? Was Ochako waiting for him behind the door to surprise him, something she'd been attempting to do ever so often since the entrance exam to no success? Remove your feet from the desk this instant. It is disrespectful to both the craftsmen of these desks as well as our predecessors. And Izuku was already exhausted. He remembered the tall boy sporting glasses from the entrance exam, and he hoped that their future interactions would not end the same way. Huh? The hell's your problem? And Izuku was now both exhausted and disappointed. He was really hoping that Bakugo would be in 1B so that he could put off the inevitable confrontation as long as possible. With a resigned sigh, he stepped into the just about half-full classroom, tuning out the argument between them and scanning the room. His eyes immediately landed on a yellow sleeping bag behind the podium in the front of the classroom, and the face of a scraggly, dark-haired man poked out of it. They stared at each other for a few seconds before Izuku shrugged and walked away toward his seat. He recognized the man as Aizawa, but hadn't thought much about his identity as a hero since it wasn't particularly relevant to him beyond sating his curiosity. Heading to his assigned seat that was regrettably behind Bakugo, he took note of his classmates that were slowly trickling into the room and lightly chatting away with each other, with the exception of a boy with bichromatic hair that appeared content with sitting in his seat with a face drowning in impassivity. A quick glance showed that the other teen had heterochromia in line with the division in his hair, as if he was two separate people that were split down the middle and fused together. How would that even work? Deku, a low growl from Bakugo pulled him out of his thoughts before he could descend into muttering. Slowly meeting the intense, piercing red eyes of the blonde filled with barely restrained indignation, Izuku was at a complete loss for what to say to him. Their last meeting hadn't been stellar, and it had been half a decade since then. He had no idea if Bakugo hated his guts and wanted to kill him or if he was actually a misguided Sundir the entire time that just couldn't properly express his feelings. He truly didn't know which one frightened him more. Izuku was spared the fate of finding out for the moment by the tall boy teleporting next to him and bowing at a perfect 90-degree angle. I must apologize for my behavior at the entrance exam, he solemnly began. It was unbecoming of a proper hero to cast judgment upon you before even speaking to you. My name is Tenya Ida, it's nice to meet you, a truly better man for figuring out the secret of the rescue points. Izuku slowly took all of that in while shaking Ida's hand. So he is just really intense, got it, he thought to himself before shooting out his other hand to catch an encroaching feminine hand attempting to sneak up on him. Close, but not good enough yet, Ochako. Damn it. She huffed with a pout before her signature smile reformed to brighten up the room. You won't see me coming one of these days. Izuku tried to ignore the mildly alarmed and calculating eyes that Bakugo bored into his skull as well as the equally assessing gaze he could feel from the heterochromatic teen to his right. If you're here to make friends, then leave now. 
the attention of the entire classroom snapped to the front where a sleeping bag was laying abandoned on the floor and Aizawa stood before them with a flat, unimpressed glare. Everyone who wasn't already in their seat quickly rushed to it, and they all silently waited for their homeroom to begin. It took you all eight seconds to get yourselves in order. Such a lengthy waste of time could cost lives in the field. I expect it to improve, he plainly stated, his glare never wavering as he reached behind the podium and pulled out a blue P.E. uniform. I'm your homeroom teacher, Shota Aizawa. Put these on and follow me to the P.E. fields. The Department of Education mandates that students not use their quirks when conducting fitness tests in middle school, Aizawa began in his signature straightforward manner. It's illogical. It gives the impression that everyone is equal when that just isn't the case, for better or for worse. Today, we'll be conducting a quirk apprehension test. Um, Mr. Aizawa, what about orientation? Achako questioned. Yua is a non-traditional school in many aspects, one of them being that it allows teachers to preside as they see fit. Heroes don't have time for frivolous matters like those, he responded, and his eyes shifted to Izuku. Midoriya, you placed first in the entrance exam. How far could you throw a ball in middle school? Izuku quirked an eyebrow at him, as he knew that Aizawa knew that he technically never went to middle school but he supposed that he could give the man a rough estimate for the sake of the exercise. About 60 meters, give or take, he answered, and the man only nodded before tossing him a ball. Throw that, this time using your quirk, he instructed. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't leave the circle. Izuku stalked toward the circle while eyeing the ball and trying to decide how he would approach this. He could ignite his green flames and simply enhance his strength to throw the ball as far as he could, but one look at Aizawa's fiercely calculating eyes that nearly rooted Izuku to his spot gave him a hunch that the man was looking for a little more than what he had already shown. Well, I suppose I've been toying with combining the flames to use them in tandem. I know what I could try, but it might make Bakugo angry. We don't have all day, came the tired voice of his teacher. Screw it, he'll get over it. Izuku took his place in the circle and ignited his base flames, blanketing him in a fiery mosaic that sparked recognition in the eyes of a few of his classmates. Holy shit, is that the rainbow comet? He heard someone try and fail to ask in a hushed tone. Blocking out the resulting chatter, he willed his flames to take on the familiar emerald that strengthened his body, and he planted his feet and winded up for the throw. Aizawa watched intently as Izuku engulfed his entire body in a green blaze with the exception of his right hand holding the ball, which was glowing. Izuku finally swung, and that glow became a bright flash as he blasted a massive fireball from his hand to launch the ball skyward in tandem with the added force his green flames allowed him. The sky above them lit up in a brief, brilliant rainbow of flame, and the class was sent into a frenzy. A few of them had their suspicions confirmed about his identity as the Rainbow Comet, while others were awestruck and excited at the impressive display. He noticed the look of reverence return in the eyes of the short, purple boy from the entrance exam, but he decided to unpack that later. Two people, however, were not particularly enthusiastic. Bakugo looked somewhere between apoplectic and constipated, which he supposed was the norm if memory served. The heterochromatic boy looked at him with a mixture of suspicion and scorn, although some of that scorn seemed to be a bit nebulous, so it might not have been entirely directed at him. That, too, he'd unpack at a later date. He had completely missed the reading of his score and only turned back around to Aizawa, just in time to hear him grimly scold a student for having fun. He supposed that his mother had said something along those lines when he was younger to emphasize the constant mortal danger of the career, especially in the underground, but threatening expulsion for getting last place felt a bit overkill. That's not fair, we just got here, and you're threatening to expel one of us on the first day, Ochako indignantly cried out. Fair, Aizawa scoffed. Are natural disasters fair? Villain attacks on civilians? Targeting a hero's family or catching them specifically on their day off, is that fair? 
Okay, Izuku could certainly concede those points. Many aspects of heroics aren't the slightest bit fair, and that just came with the job. How about paying taxes? Is that fair? What? There's nothing fair about heroics. You can accept it here and now, or you can walk away, Aizawa barked with finality. Izuku shook off his befuddlement and put his game face on. A quick look around showed that each of his classmates had hardened their resolve as well. The first test was a 50-meter dash. Ida was called up to begin alongside a girl with what appeared to be a frog mutation quirk. He would be lying if he said he wasn't excited to see his classmates' quirks in action. The engines in Ida's legs gave him an idea of what his quirk and specialty would be, but seeing him practically become a blur across the 50-meter track to finish in only 304 seconds was incredible to Izuku. Asui wasn't terribly far behind coming in at 5.58 seconds. He watched in utter fascination at the many ways his classmates applied their quirks, from Ochako making her clothes weightless to the Aoyama boy propelling himself with a laser that shot out from his navel. He found the application of the pink-skinned Ishido's acid to allow her to slide across the track in lieu of running to be especially cool, but seeing the heterochromatic boy do something very similar with ice blew his mind. Izuku felt like a kid in a candy store surrounded by such fascinating quirks and potentially just as fascinating people. Bakugo, Midoriya, you're up, Aizawa called. Izuku bounded to the starting line and brought his flames to life once again, this time a vibrant yellow blanketing him. Bakugo sauntered next to him, sneering at him and readying his palms behind him. You think you're so cool, huh, Deku? Bakugo snarled. You think you're better than me? Well, I'm gonna crush you in every single one of these dumbass tests and remind you that I'm the goddamn best. Bakugo was met with only confusion from his classmate, and that pissed him right off. He growled, resolving to let his actions do the talking and blow him out of the water. The starting signal abruptly sounded, and Bakugo wasted no time igniting his palms to launch himself across the length of the track. A vicious grin stretched across his face as he blasted himself forward, and he could almost taste the victory ahead of him. Then, an inexplicable flash of yellow lit up his periphery as the golden blur cleared the track a full second before he reached the finish line. Midoriya, 313 seconds. Bakugo, 413 seconds, Aizawa dully announced. Bakugo's brain stalled once again which was happening far too often for his tastes when the green head was involved. He watched in pregnant silence as the other teen was congratulated by the round-faced girl from earlier for getting the second fastest time. A violent spark popped within him, but he choked it down. It was his own fault. He underestimated Deku, and he paid for it. That would not happen again. The tests went by rather quickly for Izuku and he was pleasantly surprised that each test was dominated by a different person, giving him ample opportunity to see their quirks in action in the various situations they were presented. The grip strength test was simple enough for him with an application of green fire, but the masked boy with six arms went completely unmatched. The seated toe touches and sit-ups were light work for him, and he was only matched in either event respectively by a shido and a floating gym uniform. Wait, what? He took a closer look at the floating uniform in question, and it occurred to him that she must have been invisible. That really intrigued him, and he made a mental note to learn more about her quirk at some point. Moving right along, his years of dodge training helped immensely in the repeated side steps, trauma notwithstanding, but the short boy with balls for hair was the undisputed leader in that event by using his quirk as trampolines to bounce between. The ball throw was next, and Izuku was allowed to sit back and watch the others take a stab at it. There were only a few standouts. Bakugo unleashed a massive explosion while yelling die, and was promptly seething that his impressive score of 705 2 meters was apparently less than his own score. He was really interested when he saw a tall girl with long, black hair in a unique, Spiked ponytail pull an entire cannon from her midsection and launch the ball with it. Her name, Yayurazu, rang a few bells to him with the Yayurazu company, 
the largest developer of pharmaceuticals and medical instruments in Japan. He would be sure to add her to the list of fascinating quirks to learn more about. Then, there was Ochako, who just negated the gravity of the ball and tossed it into orbit. He couldn't help but return the triumphant smile she sent his way upon their teacher giving her a score of infinity. The final assessment was a long-distance run around a track in which Izuku assumed that he would lead the pack. That assumption was swiftly stomped out when Yayurazu whipped out an electric scooter with her quirk, and he numbly accepted that he would just be competing for second place. Along the way, however, he couldn't ignore the many scornful glances he got from the heterochromatic boy whose name he remembered being Todoroki. Wait, Todoroki? As in Endeavor's kid Todoroki. Did whatever beef he and my mother have get passed down to his son or something? And why did he have an ice quirk rather than fire? Or maybe he has both and just doesn't use his fire. Is that why he feels like two people fused into one? So wrapped up in his thoughts, he completely missed the almost rabid yelling from Bakugo about beating him and proving that he was better. The lack of a response only further infuriated the explosive blonde. After the assessment was completed and Aizawa stepped away to compile the scores and rank his students, Izuku made his way towards the Yayurazu girl with a single mission in mind. She laid her onyx eyes on him in surprise and curiosity, and that was enough to almost halt the burst of confidence that carried him toward her in the first place. Ochako spotted him and curiously watched the scene unfold. Yayurazu, he queried. Yes, she tentatively answered. Midoriya, right? Yes, um, this may seem rather forward, but I was really fascinated with seeing your quirk in action. Could you explain it for me? Lightly flushing at the question and sudden attention, she nodded. I can convert the lipids in my body into any material I know the chemical formula for and create whatever I need, provided I'm not creating a living organism. Izuku's eyes went wide. So, in essence, you know the chemical makeup of an electric scooter off the top of your head? Yayurazu flushed even more in mild embarrassment. Uh, well, I suppose so, when you put it like that. Her quick descent into mortification was stopped in its tracks by the boy's starry-eyed gape. That is so obscenely cool, Izuku giddily remarked. You could make literally any non-living thing for any situation with just your lipids, Granted, I assume complexity is certainly a factor, and you said you can't create living beings, but could you make organic matter? Like simple compounds such as water, or even something like wood? The boy shot into a mumble storm, and the taller girl was surprisingly able to keep up with the rapid fire inquiries. Eventually, her own excitement at finding a kindred spirit of sorts took over, and she joined in alongside him. Meanwhile, Ochako watched the two excitedly bounce ideas and concepts off of each other from afar with a tight smile. She was happy to see her new friend make more friends, as his mother not so subtly hinted that he needed any amount at all. However, she shook away those thoughts. It wasn't the time or place. Unfortunately, she wasn't as subtle as she would have liked as she turned her head to see the golden eyes of Ashido narrowed in mirth at her with a knowing smirk to match. Ochako went beet red and huffed in exasperation. Displaying all of the individual scores would be a waste of time. So here are the cumulative rankings, Aizawa drawled and displayed a holographic list from the device he used to measure their scores. Izuku checked the list and was surprised to find his name all the way in second place behind Yayurazu with Todoroki, Bakugo, and Ida rounding out the top five. He perused a little bit further and found Ochako in eleventh place, and both breathed a sigh of relief. Sitting at the very bottom spot was Maita, and Izuku legitimately felt bad for the boy that he might have helped get to the hero course in the first place. The look of horrified despair on the diminutive boy's face said it all. By the way, no one's getting expelled. Aizawa's dry delivery cut through the silence and garnered the rapt attention of the class. It was a logical ruse to push you all to do your best. You're all safe, for now. The class immediately deflated, and a few of the more social teens perked back up to talk amongst each other. 
Bakugo, meanwhile, stared daggers at the list. Deku had beaten him once again. He had beaten him in just about every assessment, actually. Deku was the better man today, and that was okay. Well, it wasn't actually okay, but it would have to be. He would get his opportunity to face Deku one-on-one -on -one and finally put things to rest by proving he's the greatest once and for all. Izuku, blissfully unaware of any of that much to Bakugo's unending chagrin, contemplated speaking to Todoroki. He didn't want to start off on the wrong foot with the boy on account of his father, but the two-toned teen didn't seem particularly receptive to conversation with anyone, so he decided to leave it alone for the moment. He'd ask his mother about later on if necessary. He vaguely heard Yayurazu mention that she figured out their teacher's logical ruse from the start, which he certainly wouldn't put past her, but he also wasn't really paying much attention until his teacher spoke up again. The path of heroics is a dangerous one. Entering without proper preparation could very easily lead to a swift death for yourself and those around you, civilian, hero, or otherwise. I've seen it happen. Aizawa hesitated and took a shaky breath. I've seen it happen far too many times. If this life isn't for you, no one would ever begrudge you for bowing out. However, if this is the path you insist on pursuing, then nothing less than your best will be accepted. Fall below that at any point, and I will not hesitate to expel you. He fixed them with a final, tired glare. Welcome to the hero course, don't disappoint. Before turning away completely, he shot them another look over his shoulder. Oh, the syllabus and any course or school information are on your desks. Pick those up before you leave today. And, with that, he turned away for good, and the class left back toward the school building. Aizawa hung around the P.E. grounds for a little while until a tall, skinny figure made his presence known. You know, stalking Verdant's son is the easiest way to end up in a full-body cast. Yagi hacked up a glob of blood at the comment, and he struggled to regain his composure. I'm not stalking him. He just... He paused, searching for the right words that wouldn't expose the secret of his quirk. He interests me. If you think that makes it sound any better, it really doesn't, Aizawa replied with a quirked eyebrow. Whatever your reasons, just don't get caught. Power Loader is only just now getting over his limp, and I doubt she'd let you off nearly as easily as him. He's a pretty advanced kid, Yagi responded, ignoring the previous line of conversation entirely. He's got a lot of potential. They all do, Aizawa replied. Him more than others, though. He has a measure of control in both his quirk and his movements that not many third years even have yet. I've noticed. There's something else about him, though, in the way he behaves. From my observation, he just feels different than the other children. Aizawa did not immediately reply. The silence held between them for a little bit as the teacher thought hard about what he wanted to say. Eventually, he opened his mouth. I haven't had much time to observe him with his classmates but I can identify that it's a level of world weariness that someone his age wouldn't normally have. Given who raised and trained him, it doesn't surprise me that much. But he's not the one with that look that worries me. Aizawa turned away and began his trek back inside. Class 1B will be out here later. Consider stalking them in lieu of my class since you'll be the foundational heroics teacher for both classes. Yagi took a moment to consider the thought. He already had his eye on one student to receive one for all, and his former sidekick was practically campaigning for another, but he only came to Yua in the first place to find a suitable successor, and there wasn't any harm in fielding other potential candidates. You know, perhaps I will. That was so intense, I really thought he was going to expel someone. Izuku mulled over the thought for the first time since leaving the classroom after the quirk apprehension test. He could definitely see where Ochako was coming from, as Aizawa was incredibly frank with them from the beginning, but he could also see why Yayurazu figured it was all a sham. Aizawa did feel like a trial-by-fire and sink-or-swim kind of teacher. Whether or not that was a good thing had yet to be determined. I must agree, the voice of Ida spoke up beside them. 
it was unbecoming of him to deceive us like that as our instructor. How can we be certain that we can trust him going forward? I don't entirely believe that it was a ruse, Izuku quietly spoke up, gaining the attention of the other two. What do you mean? Ochako asked. I don't think that he went into that exercise with the intent of expelling whoever came in last place. Someone had to come in last. That's just how things work. That said, if what he told us after the assessments was any indication, I do think he was more than willing to expel anyone he felt didn't have what it took to be a hero or wasn't putting in 100% effort, he explained, receiving thoughtful looks in return. So, we got lucky, Ochako lamented. I wouldn't call it luck. We all worked hard, and he acknowledged that, Izuku replied with a light smile. That is correct, Midoriya. Ever the insightful one, I see, Ida complimented. Something occurred to Ochako at the mention of Izuku's surname. Oh, that reminds me. Do you know that angry blonde kid in our class? He kept calling you Deku under his breath whenever he looked in your direction. It was honestly kind of funny at first but it got a little weird. I'm curious as well, Ida added. He seemed to be personally affronted at your existence. Oh, right, Izuku sighed. That's Bakugo. We practically grew up together until we were about ten. Izuku paused, wondering if he should go into detail about what happened between them and what precipitated as a result. He sighed and shrugged, figuring there was no need to keep it close to the chest anymore. To explain what happened between us, I'd first have to ask if either of you are familiar with the shutdowns of school districts and hundreds of arrests made in those districts over the years. The confusion in their eyes became recognition, and Ida nodded while Ochako answered. I heard about that. It was all over the news for a while that a ton of school districts across the country were promoting discriminatory and terrorist propaganda. Her face scrunched, and she took on a thinking pose. I read some theories that it was all a big conspiracy to indoctrinate the youth into subscribing to an old, quirkist ideology and eventually join in an uprising to institute a society based around that ideology. But I don't know how much I believe that. On his train ride home, Todoroki's head snapped up, much to the confusion of those around him at the sudden movement. Another conspiracy was afoot and he would get to the bottom of it after he determined if his father ever stepped out on his mother before he was born. Midoriya's existence seemed too suspicious to him. Izuku was trying his absolute hardest to keep from sweating at his friend's comment. You're Araka, that's preposterous. While unpleasant, systemic discrimination in the education system isn't automatically indicative of a conspiracy to incite an uprising, Ida declared with frantic chops of his hand. I know that, it's just a wild theory I came across, she relented. Um, right, Izuku shakily agreed. He certainly wasn't going to confirm or deny any theories, so he was glad for Ida's rejection of the premise and moved on. Well, the school district we were in was among those districts. I'm a late bloomer, so, at the time, people thought I was quirkless, and that made me a target. Ochako and Ida gasped but they remained quiet and allowed him to continue. Bakugo was kinda mean to me back then, but no more than anyone else was, I guess. I still wholeheartedly believe that the teachers were influencing him and everyone else, but I digress. We were friends when we were young, and he misread the kanji in my name to be Deku instead of Izuku. When he manifested his quirk and I didn't, Deku transitioned from a run-of-the-mill nickname to an insult that meant useless. I was the useless kid without a quirk. Izuku hadn't noticed that he was tearing up the more he explained, and it was only the concerned face of Ochako and her hand taking his that made him aware, and he quickly blinked the unshed tears away. It bewildered him. Beyond his training, he had never thought much about his time before his quirk officially manifested, and he took everything that had happened to him during that period in stride. Or, at least, he thought he did. Composing himself, he gave Ochako's hand a light squeeze and sent her a small, thankful smile before continuing. I finally manifested my quirk when I was ten, and then everything with the school districts happened, and I hadn't been face to face with Bakugo at all since then before today. 
I'm so sorry you had to go through that, Achako fretted. There weren't a lot of schools that were targeted in my, so I haven't met anyone who experienced that firsthand until now. Calling you Deku is so mean, he shouldn't do that. I don't really know if he hates me or if things are just ridiculously awkward between us now, Izuku replied with a mirthless chuckle. Ida, who had been silent and contemplative throughout Izuku's explanation, finally spoke up. Do not let his reprehensible behavior or that of others deter you from your own success, Midoriya. You've done well to overcome these struggles and persevere in spite of them, so I'm confident that it will be easy to continue doing so, he offered with a kind smile. Izuku, tearing up again, nodded and wiped his tears away before they could fall. He wouldn't break down in front of his friends, and he did count Ida as a friend, even after their rough start. He nodded, silently thanking them both and motioning to continue on with their walk toward the train station. Recounting those days brought up some unaddressed feelings that lay dormant within him since he was ten. He didn't like those feelings, and he didn't want anyone to have to feel that way, either. He was lucky enough to manifest a quirk, but not everyone in that position was so fortunate. Not everyone was fortunate enough to have someone violently in their corner like he did with his mother, either. What if he could be that person? What if he could be that person for everyone who got a raw deal not just from the MLA schemes, but society as a whole, even those that fell through the cracks? He may not be worthy of that responsibility just yet, and he may never truly be, but even just one person to believe in them could mean the world to someone who felt like they were at rock bottom. It was something he'd think more about when he got home, but a text from Yui shifted his attention. One of my classmates is an even bigger fan of Kaijus than me. She is, frankly, shocked and appalled at your stance on All Might against Godzilla, and she's certain that All Might wouldn't last ten seconds. He smiled, a true, non-quirk-related warmth spreading within at the thought of him having actual friends. It wasn't something he would have even considered merely a few months prior. He resolved to buy a plate of machai for Ochako and a set of Matryoshka dolls for Yui. Can we talk about how our teacher apparently doesn't pay taxes? Ochako brought up as they made their way to the train station. Yuraka, we cannot make such a scandalous claim for certain. All he said was that taxes were unfair, Ida reprimanded. Yeah, but... We can make some inferences from that, right? Achako challenged. Izuku's smile grew even bigger. He would certainly enjoy this semester. Your classmate doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. The next day was a return to the usual school schedule that Izuku didn't miss very much. He agreed that having pro heroes for teachers was certainly cool, though, and he didn't think that the novelty of that would wear off anytime soon. Even lunch was prepared by a pro hero, which Izuku was especially curious about because one man was cooking for an entire school and doing so successfully, even providing a multitude of options for them to partake in. Izuku had no idea how the man managed to pull it off, but he was thankful that he did. The only real deviation from traditional schooling was after lunch when the time came for their foundational heroics class. No one knew who their teacher was going to be, and the class was rife with speculation. Izuku had his own suspicions, but he kept quiet about them. There had to have been a reason that Nezu elected not to tell him about All Might teaching at UA, and their dedicated heroics class being the only one with a teacher unaccounted for was too convenient for him to overlook. Yo, Midoriya, who do you think our teacher's gonna be? He looked over to the boy seated to his immediate right, Hantasiro, looking back at him with his perpetual grin. He made a side note to learn more about his quirk later. Meanwhile, he figured he could have a bit of fun with his classmate. All might, was his simple reply. He expected to catch Siro off guard with the admittedly ridiculous answer and not elaborate any further to mess with him. What he did not expect was for the entire class to stop and look in his direction. Now, with nineteen pairs of eyes on him, one being an especially scrutinizing red-eyed glare, Izuku found himself a deer in headlights. He could even feel the invisible gaze of Hagakure fixed on him two seats ahead. All might? Seriously? 
I don't know if the number one hero could take time out of his schedule to become a teacher. Well, he did do the recordings for the acceptance letters, so it's possible, Ribbit. Deciding to roll with it, he pointedly turned to the door and held out his hand. The class went silent again, and he silently counted down from five with his fingers, then he pointed at the door upon reaching zero. The class remained dead silent as they watched the door on the edge of their seats. The tension in the room was only heightened by the sound of footsteps making their way towards the classroom. And then, nothing happened. The class waited in silence for a little while longer to see just who would come through the door. When the door hadn't opened after another five seconds, Bakugo turned back to Izuku with a mocking sneer. Ha, ah, you nerd, there's no way All Might himself. I am, a familiar voice boomed from outside of the room, coming through the door like a normal person. Holy shit, it's All Might. Midoriya was right. Is that his Silver Age costume? Izuku slowly craned his head to face the dumbfounded expression of Bakugo, and he gave him a dry smirk before doing a small bow. It was worth it to the green head to see the blonde valiantly fight off blowing a gasket in his seat. All Might pressed a button on a remote, and a panel in the wall opened to reveal a set of lockers with numbers corresponding to their seats. After they grabbed the cases containing their costumes, they were herded to the locker rooms to get changed for their first practical lesson in heroics. Izuku sat on a bench and stared down at the unopened case holding his costume. When he first drew up a design at the age of four, it was heavily inspired by All Might. It even included a cowl with two long appendages that were supposed to be reminiscent of All Might's two signature locks of hair. As he grew and his hero worship of All Might slowly diminished into something less fanatical, he revisited and reworked the costume idea. He wanted to keep the influence of All Might, as the insurmountable mountain of a man was still his hero, but he also wanted to pay homage to his mother's costume for her efforts in getting him to this point in the first place. The end result was a black spandex suit with white flame decals traveling up the sides of his abdomen and down his legs, as well as a reflective flame symbol on his chest that the notes in the case assured was as flameproof as the rest of the suit. He wore a pair of white gloves and a matching pair of white boots, and on his waist was a green utility belt as a nod to his mother since he felt wrong not having green anywhere in the costume otherwise. Completing the ensemble was a white cape that he included as a callback to All Might's older costumes. He requested the cape to be made of a special material that allowed him to remove it and use it as a capture weapon, similar to the capture scarf used by Eraserhead. Wait a minute, Izuku thought with a contemplative frown. So, that's who Aizawa is. How did I not piece that together sooner? After getting dressed into his costume, he started to make his way towards ground beta, noticing someone begin to walk in step with him. I was expecting a lot more color for the rainbow comet, the blonde kid with a black lightning bolt in his hair kaminari, he believed playfully remarked. This was it, a casual social situation with someone he hadn't explicitly befriended. He somehow made it through the interaction with Ciro and the resulting mishap in class unscathed, so he knew he could make it through this one too. He wasn't going to mess this up. My quirk provides enough color as it is, he responded with a totally unrehearsed laugh. Any more color on the suit would have been overkill. Ha, ah, I hear ya, Kaminari replied with a smile. Wow, I made it through that. I should ask him about his quirk, Izuku excitedly thought before taking a breath and calming down. No, I'll wait until after class, I'll probably see it in action again, anyway. The bulk of the class reached ground beta to see All Might waiting on them. He proudly looked over their costumes until his eyes landed on Izuku, and his breath hitched. There were certainly differences, but watching the boy walk out in his black jumpsuit, white boots, and oh-so-familiar white cape gave him incredibly warm and painful flashbacks. One for all buzzed inside of him again, and he swore that he could faintly hear a voice shouting in the back of his mind. That's him. That's him. Yes, that's him. My successor, he thought to himself seemingly in confirmation. No, you blonde buffoon. That's my grandson. 
shouted a woman wearing a similar getup to Izuku in a black, foggy void. He still can't hear you, Nana, a shorter, high-collared man sighed in exasperation. All Might shook himself out of his stupor and regained his signature grin. The clothes really do make the man? Izuku, I love your costume, Ochako bubbly chirped beside him. I was expecting a little more color, though. I wanted to pay homage to my mom's costume and All Might's while still making something of my own, he chuckled. I'm not sure how much I love the cape, though, now that I'm wearing it. Your costume is really cool, too. I can definitely see the space motif you're going for. Ochako beamed at the recognition, and then her smile faltered a bit. I'm glad you noticed. I wanted something a little more puffy, though, sorta like 13 suit. This one's a little skin tight. Then, something occurred to her. I've never seen your mom's costume. It's like mine, but greener, and no cape, Izuku answered simply. Izuku could have sworn that he caught the eye of Gyro, but she quickly looked away, so he pushed it out of his mind. Costume Were the simultaneous thoughts of Bakugo and Todoroki as they overheard that bit of the conversation. Since when was Auntie Inko a hero? So, his mother is a pro. That would provide a motive and an opportunity. All might cut into their radically different rumination by explaining what their first class would be, a battle trial. He explained with the help of cue cards that the class would be divided into teams of two. The teams would face off against each other in a mock scenario where one team played the role of villains holding a large bomb within a building, and the other team would play the role of heroes attempting to thwart them. He held out a box for them to draw lots for what team they'd be a part of, and Izuku found himself on Team J. He looked to Ochako, but she, unfortunately, was on Team C. He looked around for his partner as the class started to group up until he felt something pat him through his cape. Turning around, he saw no one, and he was confused until a floating glove waved at him. Hi there, guess we're partners for today, Hagakure excitedly said. Izuku blinked, and then he returned the smile he was certain she was sending him. I guess we are. He noticed that she was wearing a pair of gloves and shoes, but he couldn't see anything else. Before he could ask about it, their teacher's voice filled the area. Now, for the first group, All Might bellowed as he reached into a box with labeled slips of paper. The hero team will be Team J. Oh wow, we have to go first. Hagakure said while Izuku focused his eyes on the box in All Might's hands. And the villain team will be Team B. Izuku looked around for any team to perk up an acknowledgement, and his eyes landed on the feral grin of Bakugo and cold glare of Todoroki directed back at him. Got him it. Inko stepped into Principal Nezu's office with a contemplative frown. She was on her break and that usually entailed sitting in the teacher's lounge reading trashy romance novels with Snipe while Aizawa pretended to not fanboy in her presence across the room. But Nezu specifically called her into the office rather than sending her a text. That likely meant that whatever it was, he didn't want a written record of it. You wanted to see me, sir? Inko questioned with a raised eyebrow. You may drop the formalities for this meeting, Nezu assured. Today, we are equals once again. So, this is about a case, then, Inko quickly surmised. That case in particular, yes, he confirmed. Inko's frown deepened. You have a new lead? Nezu nodded and pulled out several articles from his desk. It's a tenuous one, but I feel there's something here. Within the past year and a half, there has been a steady uptick in hit pieces directed at UA, its staff, and myself as the principal. It ranged from simple things like expulsions potentially creating vigilantes and villains, to not-so-simple things like singling out UA for creating child soldiers to fight for the public's amusement in the sports festival. Inko took a careful look through the articles in concern until one thing stood out to her. These are all from the same publisher. So, you noticed. Nezu nodded with a smile. At first, I wasn't sure if it was just a single writer or publisher with an axe to grind against Yue for one reason or another, but I do love a good investigation. 
A further look into this Shueisha publishing didn't reveal anything out of the ordinary, which I expected. However, a look into their executive director and occasional writer, Chidos Kazuki, unearthed some interesting details. Do tell, Inko said while sitting down across from him. When I had people go undercover into different quirkist groups I suspected were being financially supported. One of them was a larger group primarily congregating on a message board that had monthly meetups for demonstrations and recruitment. Nezu took a sip of tea from a cup that Inko was certain wasn't there initially, but she learned years ago to stop questioning it. During one of those meetups, my operative was able to accompany the moderator of the message board to a meeting with a woman fitting Kazuki's description. It was a handoff of information, though we're still not certain exactly what information was given. How can you be sure that it's the same woman, Inko ventured, to which Nezu only retrieved a picture and slid it across the desk to her. Ah, point taken, she responded upon seeing the picture. So, you think she's directly involved with the MLA? Nizu nodded. Being a middleman that only runs information between parties wouldn't be worth the time of someone with her position, and it would also be an equally large waste of an asset. As the executive director of a major news publication, she no doubt has considerable influence over information distribution to the public. And that means the MLA already had a steady influence on information flow irrespective of their indoctrination schemes, Inko added. That definitely recontextualizes all of the news that comes out of there. It also means that Yua is directly in their crosshairs if these hit pieces are any indication. A small, dangerous smile bearing more teeth than Inko was comfortable with developed onto Nezu's face. Yes, I suppose we are. Inko would be lying if she said she didn't begin to sweat at his predatory tone. It appears that war may come sooner than we had anticipated. So that's the story between me and Bakugo, and that's why I'm fairly sure that he's going to abandon the bomb entirely to come directly after me, Izuku finished explaining with a sigh. Oh no, I'm sorry for making you relive all of that, Hagakure exclaimed, frantically waving her gloved hands. It's fine, he quickly assured her. I'm getting past it, and it's better to know these things now before they potentially result in disaster later on. Well, we have a few minutes left. Got a plan in that green noggin of yours? Izuku's smile returned with an edge to it. I do, actually. I take it that you're pretty good at sneaking around. She nodded, but when he stayed silent, she remembered that he couldn't see her, so she gave him a thumbs up. Right, well, I'd normally suggest that you sneak your way through the building and locate the bomb while I keep Bakugo busy, but Todoroki has a pretty powerful ice quirk, and I'm not certain how far it reaches. Given your costume situation, you might catch hypothermia if you're frozen, and I'm not around to thaw you out and heat you back up. So, you just want to stay around and keep me warm, huh? She playfully teased. Basically, he casually replied. She huffed, lamenting her failed attempt to get a rise out of him. What about all explodey? How hard can you hit? Pretty hard. Izuku hummed in consideration. Punch me in the gut as hard as you can. Ooh, are you sure? She hesitantly questioned. Yes, I've seen Bakugo take a hard hit and keep on going on pure spite and hatred alone. He's no doubt gotten tougher since then, so I just want to measure what we're working with, he responded. Give it all you got, I can take it. Okay, she reluctantly accepted. Izuku flexed his abs and mentally prepared himself for the coming blow. He didn't want to underestimate the girl, so he readied himself for a hit as if he himself was throwing it. He was not at all prepared to be folded over an invisible arm with a gloved fist firmly planted in his stomach. His eyes were bulging out of his skull, and he just barely kept his very soul from being ejected from his body on impact. He fell to his knees and hacked his life away while Hagakure apologetically fretted over him. Holy hell, it feels like I just got hit by a Texas smash, Izuku struggled between breaths, and he flashed her a wobbly grin. You've got a mean straight punch. Well, when your whole thing is being invisible, 
You gotta develop some other talents to keep up, she sheepishly chuckled with a not so insignificant measure of pride. I think we'll be just fine, Izuku told her with a confident smile. Your ten minute prep time has concluded, All Might's voice blared over their earpieces. Go. Listen up, Mr. M Freeze, I'm hunting down Deku and beating him into the ground. I don't care what you do, just stay out of my way, Bakugo snarled at Todoroki. Todoroki's impassive stare did not falter for a second as he walked past Bakugo and placed his right hand on the wall. There won't even be a fight, and I don't need your help. Bakugo might have been intimidated by his chilly tone if not for the ridiculously goofy ice prosthetic covering his left side with a glowing red eye. Instead, he just felt even more annoyed. That annoyance became shock when Todoroki froze the entire building in an instant. Turning away from him, Todoroki calmly walked towards the door amidst Bakugo's silence. They're done. Let's capture them and get this over with, he coldly instructed. That snapped Bakugo out of his stupor, and his annoyance returned tenfold. Don't order me around, Ice Terminator. Izuku felt the sudden, abrasive cold before his quirk activated on instinct with a flash of orange, and the hallway they were in glaciered in the blink of an eye. As if on a mental command, the hallway was blanketed in a deep crimson, and the red flames of his quirk quickly melted the surrounding ice. Looking over to check on his partner, he was greeted with the sight of Hagakure wrapped in a snug-looking blanket of orange fire. If her head movements at least, what he could assume was her head were any indication, she was just as confused as he was. Huh, I forgot I could do that, Izuku calmly stated. You forgot? Hagakure shouted. I thought your quirk was just colorful fire that lets you move fast sometimes. What even is this? Izuku could tell from her hands curiously probing and examining the orange fire blanketing her that her tone was less accusatory and more excitedly inquisitive. Well, I can separate my quirk into individual flames that each allow me to do different things, he answered. It's kind of a lot to explain. So I'll just say that red gives me even more intense heat in localized areas, and I've only ever used orange once at the entrance exam. I think it forms barriers that I can protect people with, but it activates subconsciously thus far. That is so cool. My grandson is so cool. The vestiges of one for all were watching the battle trial through the unwitting eyes and ears of all might and they could hear Izuku's explanation to go along with a showcase of his quirk. Nana was positively over the moon with pride at her grandson, while En and Degoro Banjo were shaking their heads in amused exasperation. Banjo could definitely concede that Nana's grandson had looked pretty cool up to that point, though. Hikid Shinomori and Yoichi Shigaraki, however, were watching the scene with critical eyes, Yoichi especially. Is that? Hikid began. Singularity, Yoichi finished. Looks like it. Sheesh, Hikage sighed. You think Eighth is going to try to pass it on to him? I certainly hope not, Yoichi replied. Two quirks reaching singularity within one person. I'd rather Nana not have to watch her successor clean the remains of her grandson off of the floor and walls. Izuku retracted the protective orange shield and focused his quirk in melting a path down the hall for the two. It didn't take long for them to realize that Todoroki had frozen the entire building. Hey, Midori, Hagakure spoke up. Momentarily taken aback by the nickname, Izuku stumbled. Midori, you've poured your heart and soul to me in our first conversation and saved me from being frozen, and I've folded you over my fist for science. I think we've already advanced to being best friends today. That's fair, Izuku conceded with a chuckle. I don't have a cool nickname for you yet, unfortunately. Just Toru is fine. Roger that. What did you need? Well, since Todoroki froze the building, how likely is it that he thinks we're frozen too and left the bomb unguarded to capture us? Izuku froze for a moment as he hadn't considered that, and his eyes lit up with another plan. How well do you think you can sneak around on ice? I used to train by silently navigating through a room covered in broken glass. Ice will be child's play, 
Toru confidently replied. Awesome. I'll find a large enough room and make a ton of noise to draw them to my position while you find the bomb. Aye, aye, Captain, Toru said with a mock salute and scampered off down the hall. Izuku made his way down the hall in the other direction, passing through the corridors to find an empty room that was suitable enough for the distraction. He knew that he'd likely end up taking on both Bakugo and Todoroki, so he needed room to dodge explosions and more glaciers. He wasn't sure if they'd work well together, however, but he'd make them pay for it if they didn't. Finally finding an optimal room, he ignited his red flames and melted the ice, even subliming it directly into steam at points. The room was filled with steam and slippery patches of mostly melted ice, and Izuku's flames of ruby transitioned to emerald like Gen 3, and he clapped his hands together as hard as he could to both clear the room and create a thunderous boom to draw his two opponents to his location. All he had to do now was wait, so he waited, and waited, and waited. After around 15 seconds, he started to get a little impatient, so he took a shot in the dark and speculated that they were waiting outside the room in case it was a trap. With that in mind, he decided to push the easiest button he knew of to get the show on the road. Hey, back you go, I'm better than you and you know it. The hell you are, you bastard. Bakugo bounded down the hall and into the room with a vicious snarl. The bright sunshine of Izuku's yellow fire took over, and he darted out of the way of the furious blonde's initial explosion. Bakugo threw an explosion at him again, and Izuku dodged again, and again, and again. They kept up the intense game of cat and mouse with Bakugo launching himself at Izuku with explosion after explosion. Meanwhile Izuku dodged each one with an apparent ease that felt so mocking to Bakugo. The boy was practically bouncing around the room like a yellow pinball, and Bakugo was getting incredibly sick of it. The intermittent kicks and punches he received whenever Izuku bounded past him that often came close to knocking the wind out of him were not helping matters, either. Stop dodging and face me. Deku, he commanded. Izuku, feeling the strain begin to set in on his chest, obliged him and landed in a crouch in front of him deactivating his quirk all the while. Bakugo felt truly insulted in that moment by him deactivating his quirk, and he would make the boy pay for it in blood. Don't you dare look down on me, you piece of shit. Bakugo threw himself at Izuku in his rage, telegraphing a right hook that Izuku was more than happy to exploit by hooking the arm and using the blonde's own momentum to toss him over his hip and onto the concrete. It was a scene very reminiscent of their schoolyard scuffle five years prior, and Bakugo knew that all too well. He stared up at Izuku with wide eyes, feeling just as bewildered as he did back then. He felt just as small, just as insignificant. He felt just as inferior. Izuku only had a fraction of a second to notice Bakugo's thousand-yard stare before his instincts screamed at him once again and he went back up in yellow fire to just barely dodge the pillar of ice that slammed through where he once stood, carefully skirting around Bakugo to avoid freezing him as well. I told you this would be a trap, came the annoyed voice of Tadaroki from the entrance. You clearly can't finish this yourself, so I will. Izuku, feeling an almost alien rush of confidence and snark, decided to roll with it and respond. You're more than welcome to try, Terminator. Holy hell, he even got your one-liners, Banjo laughed alongside Nana, who was currently using N's collar to wipe the tears of joy from her face. Right? And look at how well my little baby Inko trained him. He's moving even better than me, Nana cried. Yoichi quietly sighed with a mixture of fondness and dismay. The boy looked like he'd make for a great ninth wielder but it just wasn't in the cards. That invisible girl, though, she did have a wicked right. Izuku was mildly disappointed at the lack of verbal or facial response from the heterochromatic teen, but he didn't have time to dwell on it since he was busy dodging the resulting ice spikes that shot at him. They were faster than Bakugo's explosion, however, and he only narrowly avoided being skewered on a few occasions. After the fifth tier on his costume, he decided to switch tactics. 
he put out his yellow fire and green took its place, and he met the next mini glacier with a solid right hook, smashing into the ice with enough force to shatter it entirely. Momentarily taken aback, Todoroki only acted in instinct when blasting another mini glacier to block the split-second advance by the newly golden Izuku, trapping him in the ice in front of him. Putting his confusion at the boy's constant changing of color and powers aside, he exhaled his tension away at a seemingly apprehended foe. That relief was short-lived, though, as the ice flashed red and practically blew apart with the green head forcing his way out shrouded in crimson fire. The heat became too much for even him to deal with, and he quickly backed off. Or, rather, he backed off as quickly as he could manage since the frostbite from overusing his ice started to hit him. The sluggishness would come to bite him, as he received a left hook to the jaw and a boot to the sternum in rapid succession for his troubles. Midoriya was beginning to become a truly troublesome opponent. Izuku, meanwhile, wasn't faring much better. The strain was really beginning to hit him, as well, and he didn't need Recovery Girl whacking him with her cane again. He wanted to prolong the fight as long as possible to give Toru time to find the objective, but it looked more and more as though he needed to end the fight quickly if he didn't want to be captured and leave her to fend for herself two-on-one. The two teens intensely stared each other down as they picked up that the other was slowing, and they both knew that the end for one of them was near. All these years, came a raspy, feral growl to the side of them. They broke eye contact and looked over to see an absolutely tempestuous-looking Bakugo clutching his right gauntlet. All these years you've been looking down on me, those extras only kissed up to me, and those shitty teachers tried to use me as their patsy. I'm no one's pawn, I'm no one's stepping stone, and I'm no one's measuring stick. I'm the best, and that's all I'll ever be. He roared and yanked the pin from his gauntlet with both Izuku and Todoroki in the line of fire. The resulting explosion was gargantuan, shaking the building and weakening the structural integrity even more than flash freezing it did. Bakugo panted at ground zero, watching intently for any signs of movement. He was both relieved and enraged when there was movement in the rubble ahead of him, and a soot-covered Izuku sporting a freshly torn costume emerged with a barely conscious Todoroki hanging off his arm. The glare Bakugo received from those emerald eyes was so frigid that he was rooted in place. The blonde swore he saw flickers of black enter the boy's eyes and spark in his green hair. It was exponentially more threatening than the contemptuous glare he received half a decade prior in the alleyway. Izuku, meanwhile, felt an unfamiliar level of rage leak into him the longer he laid eyes on the blonde. The blackness he briefly felt that day months before the entrance exam was returning much hotter than previously, and Izuku struggled to keep a lid on it out of fear of what sort of damage it could do if he didn't. Then, a chunk of ice slammed down onto the back of Bakugo's head, and he limply fell into unconsciousness. Izuku's surprise gave him the opportunity he needed to swallow that blackness and lock it away again. He looked over to the limp form of Bakugo to find capture tape floating above him and proceed to wrap around the boy. Midori, what the hell happened down here? The voice of Toru shouted from above Bakugo's captured form. Toru? he asked in confusion. I thought you were looking for the bomb. I felt that massive explosion and figured you might need help, she frantically reasoned. Ah, that, he bemusedly chuckled. You came at the perfect time, I am absolutely spent. I can see that, you're barely standing up straight with him unconscious on your arm, she giggled. Izuku looked over to see that Todoroki was indeed slumped over in unconsciousness. Huh, so he is. He removed his cape with his free hand and appeared to twirl it, forming it into a thinner piece of fabric that wrapped tightly around Todoroki. Erm, hero team wins, came the shocked voice of All Might through their earpieces. Awesome, Izuku breathed out. Please catch me, he said before slipping into unconsciousness himself and falling forward with Toru scrambling to keep him from hitting the ground. The control room was silent. The entire class, teacher included, could only stare at the screen, mouths agape. No one moved a muscle until All Might snapped out of it and sprung into action, 
leaping out of the room and toward the building to collect his three unconscious students. The rest of the class was left to make sense of the titanic clash they had just witnessed. Three of the strongest kids in their class just beat the piss out of each other, and one of them may have tried to commit murder against the other two. And, in the end, the winner was still the guy who was outnumbered in the first place. How are we supposed to follow that? Kaminari shouted, voicing what just about everyone was thinking. Izuku awoke to the unfortunate sight of white walls and the unfortunate feeling of a hospital bed. He immediately deflated when he realized where he was. I thought I told you not to overdo it again, recovery girl scolded him at his bedside. Would you believe that I didn't have a choice again? He offered with a sheepish smile. The old medic sighed in resignation, knowing that it was the truth. When Tashinori came in with you three, he explained what happened. I want to be upset at you, but you weren't the one being reckless this time around. Her face scrunched in frustration. He should have stopped the match, and Bakugo shouldn't have gone as far as he did. But we're here now, and from what Toshinori told me, you seem to know restraint again this time around, so I'll give you props for that. Izuku was just glad that he wouldn't be getting whacked in the head. You're thinking too loudly, young man, recovery girl smirked after lightly whacking him with her cane. Her smile then softened to a kind one. You didn't go overboard and hurt yourself with your quirk, so all you needed was some rest to regain your stamina. You're good to go. Thanks, recovery girl, Izuku returned her smile and shuffled out of bed and out of the room. He noticed that he passed the unconscious figures of Todoroki and Bakugo on his way out but he didn't stop to check on them. He had faith in Recovery Girl, and he also had a sinking feeling that Bakugo would be in some shit when he awoke, which he wanted no part of. He made it back to Ground Beta in time for the rest of the class to be headed back to the locker rooms, and he was immediately tackled by an invisible missile. Midori, you're okay, Toru gleefully shouted. Izuku momentarily blew screened at being hugged with no warning by the one person other than his mother who can consistently sneak up on him, largely because she was still practically naked. She seemed to realize this, and she sheepishly stepped back and gave him some space. That space was not to be, however, as a second blur in the form of Ochako slammed into him and accidentally negated his gravity, causing him to float into the air above the class while struggling in vain to right himself. Ochako quickly cancelled her quirk, and he plummeted right into the arms of Shoji. Sup, Shoji said after a moment of silence. Yo, Zuku replied just as casually as if he wasn't in a bridal carry. You are strong. So are you, Shoji replied with mirth edging into his voice. Fair enough, Izuku replied with a light smile and the taller boy let him back down to his feet. The moment he was back on solid ground, the entire class surrounded him. Dude, that fight was so manly, Kirishima shouted. Where did you learn to move like that? I could hardly follow you, Siro asked. Did you train at a dojo? Ajiro asked. I can't believe Bakugo tried to blow you two up. I mean, I can, but still, Ashido shouted in frustration. That frustration seemed like it was much too familiar to her. Now, now, children, please do not crowd him. He just recovered from an intense battle. Thankfully came the voice of All Might, and the class gave the boy some much appreciated space. All Might watched as he nervously answered their questions and shyly accepted their praise. It was a stark contrast from the alert, self-assured teen he was in the heat of battle. It brought a genuine smile to the number one's face. Internally, one for all was a different story. Let me at the little shit. I'll tear him apart for trying to hurt my boy. Nana practically snarled while being restrained by Banjo and N. Why are we even holding her back? It's not like she can leave the void and hurt him for real, Banjo queried to N through strained grunts in their efforts to keep the apoplectic grandmother contained. I'd rather not test if she could find a way, and replied with equal strain. Bakugo felt like utter crap. He had a killer headache and his body was as sore as all hell, but the real casualty was his pride. His pride had been beaten, flogged, 
tarred, and feathered before being paraded through the public square for the townspeople to throw tomatoes at. In other words, he was not feeling good, physically or emotionally. He had been nothing short of embarrassed in the battle trial by Deku. He couldn't land a single blow on Deku when he was using his quirk. Deku easily countered his attack and put him on his ass again when he wasn't using his quirk. Deku danced around him and put him in his place, and he made it look easy while he was doing it. At least half and half looked like he made Deku work for it. Deku looked like he actually had to try against the peppermint bastard, but he, himself, was nothing but a warm-up. That hurt. That really hurt. Not only did Deku surpass him over the past five years, but he wasn't even second to the green head. He wasn't even sure if he was third. Who the hell knew what that walking pocket dimension chick was capable of when shit got serious? He winced, and his hand went up to cradle his head. He had no idea what the hell hit him, but it left him with the worst headache he had ever experienced. It was the maraschino cherry on top of the horseshit Sunday of a day. How's your head, young man? The voice of an old lady piped up beside his bed. He would forgive himself for not noticing her this time around, but he wouldn't make a habit of allowing people to sneak up on him. It feels like foggy shit, he murmured. I'm not surprised, she remarked. Getting a chunk of ice slammed directly to the skull will do that to you. You're lucky to only have a concussion from that. A chunk of ice, he confusedly thought until it hit him. The invisible girl, he growled out. You don't get to be bitter, boy, she scolded while stepping aside and allowing the still unconscious Todoroki into view. Look at what you did to your partner with that last explosion. Bakugo was taken completely off guard. He hadn't really thought about the last attack he pulled in his rage-fueled haze until that very moment, and he internally winced. Then, he physically winced when he saw the rough state Todoroki was in. There weren't any scars beyond the one he already had, but his costume was practically burned away and he looked rather beaten up. He couldn't determine how much of that was from him and how much was from Deku, but that wasn't the point. I'd rip into you for your absolutely comical level of recklessness that could have gotten yourself and others killed or seriously hurt, but someone else is waiting outside to speak to you first, and anything I say would either be redundant or much nicer than what you're about to get, recovery girl huffed before closing the curtain separating his and Todoroki's beds, and then she walked away to open the door. Who the hell wants to talk to me? He muttered lowly to no one in particular. I do, was the curt reply of a very familiar voice. He craned his head to inspect the new arrival, and he saw a woman wearing a black spandex suit with a green mask to match her green gloves and green hair. Oh, I'd scold you for the language, but I think that's pretty apropos for your situation, so I'll allow it just this once, she replied in a clipped tone. Bakugo's brain was busy catching up with the situation. Standing in front of him was Auntie Inko in a hero costume that he had no idea she even owned. He foggily remembered Deku talking with round face about it, but it was a ridiculous thought at the time, and seeing it was very different than hearing about it. Regardless, she looked pissed. In fact, she looked beyond pissed. She looked absolutely livid in a very calm, frigid way that he knew only she could. He had only gotten in trouble with her once before when he and Deku were very young, and once was more than enough. He realized that she was glaring at him just like Deku was in the battle trial, but it was a little different. The same rage in his eyes was present in hers, but hers was violently composed and seemed to be molded into a sharp edge ready to stab into him at a moment's notice as opposed to Deku's that was a barely contained inferno primed to burn him and the rest of the building to ashes. She wasn't speaking, either. The silence hung heavy in the air as he actually started to wilt under her glare, something that never happened to Katsuki Bakugo. He never backed down from anything or anyone, and he valiantly tried to meet her stare head-on, but the oppressive aura of murder and maternal fury that dwarfed even his own mother's was almost suffocating. What the hell were you thinking, Katsuki? Inko finally asked in a measured tone. And that was a great question. 
What exactly was he thinking when he aimed his gauntlet at Deku and Mr. P Freeze and pulled the pin? Was he thinking about how furious he was for being inferior to Deku of all people? Was he thinking about how much it ate at him that he was a pawn in some head scheme that drove Deku away to become that powerful in the first place? What about how much it stung to not only be proven inferior to Deku but to Peppermint Butler as well? Was he thinking about all the years he swore to himself and everyone else that he was indisputably the best, only for it to all just be a convoluted fabrication? Was it that his whole belief that he was the best might have been in part propped up by the designs of a group of terrorists that didn't truly believe in him, only in what his success could do for themselves in the future? He didn't really know what to say. He didn't know how to answer her question or any of his own. He didn't know which question was the answer to her question, so he just spilled all of them to her. He told her every question, every conundrum, every doubt, every contradiction, and every passing thought he had. Inko remained silent throughout the entire explanation. In all honesty, it was less of an explanation and more of the blonde unloading years of bottled-up insecurities that he'd been holding on to since he was ten. Her glare had softened over the course of his venting, but her face was still kept carefully blank. He couldn't read her face at all for what she was thinking, and it made him nervous, but he was already neck-deep in flushing whatever was left of his pride. When he was finished, or, more accurately, when he had nothing left inside of him to spill, his mouth snapped shut, and the two stared at each other for what felt like hours to the blonde. If the clock was to be believed, it had only been two minutes. Katsuki, she finally spoke up, I'm going to tell you a story, and I want you to be silent and not interrupt until I'm finished. I'll tell you when I'm finished. Understood? He nodded and she grabbed a lone chair to sit down in. When I was in high school, I didn't have many friends. Truth be told, I had two of them. You can probably make a guess as to who one of them was, but that isn't the point. My two friends were all I really had. I'm not sure if Izuku ever told you, but I'm adopted. My adoptive parents were loving, certainly, but it was also very clear that they adopted in the first place out of the aesthetic of having a complete family unit. They were well off, so they could afford to do it and not really think about it, and they weren't always emotionally available people. For a long time, my two best friends were the center of my world. They felt like the family that I often wished my own family could have been, both times. She sighed, keeping herself on track and away from any tangents. Bakugo was still silent, paying rapt attention to her every word despite not yet seeing any relevance. I brought that up to give a bit of background for the actual point of this story. I went into the heroics track while they didn't, but they still supported me every step of the way, through graduation and beyond. I was underground, so I didn't interact with limelight heroes much and involved myself with the public and the press as little as possible. Meanwhile, there was a particular limelight hero a little older than myself that did all he could to present himself to the public. He was powerful, too. Still is. Back then, he was everywhere apprehending criminals, rescuing civilians, taking down villains like Candy, and he made a flashy show of his strength all the while. I remember him saying at some point that civilians were not points to be earned, and he didn't do any of it for the fame, the wealth, or the notoriety. He just wanted to be the best. He wanted to be number one. He wanted to step out of the shadow and finally surpass one man, All Might. Bakugo was still silent, but he wasn't so confused anymore. Beginning aside, he was starting to see why she was telling him this story. He just had no idea where it was going to go. The fundamental problem with that goal is that All Might is not a goal to be surpassed. All Might is barely a man. He's a symbol, an almost theoretical concept of heroics that isn't meant to be outdone, at least not in any practical way. All Might is so inhumanly powerful that attempting to bridge the gap between yourself and him isn't something that anyone would be able to achieve in their lifetime. And that's just regarding power and ignoring the sheer significance his very presence has on our society. Are you still following? At his shaky nod, she continued. So, 
What does an insanely prideful man that's so singularly focused on bridging that gap do when he realizes that it just isn't going to happen? What does that man do when he realizes that he can never be the best, especially as he is, and that there will always be at least one person ahead of him for as long as he lived? Bakugo wasn't sure if the question was rhetorical, or if she was legitimately asking him what he thought a man like that would do. He didn't answer either way. She hadn't yet told him that she was finished. What happened was that the man did not let go of his ambitions. He stubbornly held on to them for dear life, even at the cost of those around him. All that mattered to him was surpassing all might, and if he couldn't do it himself, he would just pass the buck. That came in the form of a cute little homemade eugenics project he cooked up. What the, Bakugo couldn't help but spit out, immediately recoiling when he realized that he interrupted her. Inko only chuckled without a trace of mirth in her tone. What is right, she bitterly lamented. He, in his infinite wisdom, figured that he could overcome the weaknesses of his quirk by selectively breeding the weaknesses out of it creating a perfect offspring that had all of the power and benefits of his own quirk without the mitigating factors that would limit them. Inko's face soured and her tone took a hateful, razor-sharp edge. To do that, however, he needed a proper specimen. He needed someone with biological counters to the roadblocks he faced in his bid for number one. Wouldn't you believe it that one of my best friends was the perfect candidate? Inko's fists tightened in her lap, and Bakugo could see the ocean of raw hatred and malice in her eyes. It was deeply unsettling to see that look in the eyes of a woman he could only remember warm, unfettered kindness from. He went about, courting her, and I use that term very loosely. He practically whined and dined her parents into an arranged marriage, and the end result was that he got his disgusting little project off the ground. When the first attempt proved to be a failure, he discarded the adorable little twins with quirks that only functioned well together but would never function separately. He tried again, and it failed again, so he moved on again. His own children were nothing but tools to him that were disposable when they weren't able to be what he wanted them to be, which was the golden little miracle baby that would grow up to surpass all might so that he could live vicariously through them. There was no love, no affection, and no real connection, at least from his end. I don't know what happened with the last child. My friend and I, we had an argument when she was pregnant. It was bad. We didn't speak for a decade afterward. I did keep tabs on the family, though, and do you know what ultimately the end result of his little eugenics project was? Inko leaned forward and narrowed her eyes at Bakugo. One dead child three traumatized children, and a mother that was committed to a mental hospital. All for the sake of surpassing all might, all for the sake of finally being the best. Inko leaned back into her chair and away from Bakugo's pale, alarmed expression. So, in review, he never became the best despite his efforts, and he left a dead child, a shattered family, and a likely horrifically traumatized teenager in his wake. That's what happens when you put every fiber of your being into chasing a running ghost. That's what happens when you center your very existence around scaling a mountain that's just too steep to reach the peak of. Bakugo felt as though Inko was performing an autopsy on his soul with just her piercing gaze. You'll end up dead if you're lucky, and you'll end up hurting or killing everyone around you one by one if you're not. And, if the battle trial is any indication, you're already well on your way. Bakugo felt his stomach plummet to the depths of his sphincter at the reminder combined with the Antarctic glare he was receiving. So, Katsuki Bakugo, I've known you since you barely were a gleam in your mother's eye. I know that you want to be the best. I know that you've thought for a long time that you were. I know that no longer being the big man on campus is an unfamiliar and frightening concept for you and you'll do anything and everything to return to the status quo. I know that you feel used by the teachers at your former school district, and you want to prove that you're the best on your own merits and no one else's. I know that you want to surpass All Might himself one day and sit upon your throne atop the hero rankings. There was a heavy silence as she continued staring at him, 
fixing him in place as if his answer to whatever question she was building up to would decide his future there and then. Are you willing to sacrifice your humanity in order to do that like many before you have? The question should have been an easy one for Bakugo, and he almost immediately went to give her an emphatic no. However, something stayed his hand. After everything she told him, he knew that it was a question that he really needed to think over, as even though it appeared obvious on the surface, thinking about it purely on a surface level would lead him on a path to becoming the poor schmuck in her story. Bakugo could have potentially ended multiple lives that day, and he truly realized that, now, his refusal to be anything less than the best and his desire to wipe out any and every bit of competition very well could have landed him a comfy cell in Tartarus for killing the children of two pro-heroes. If the gravity of the conversation hadn't already been weighing on him like a lead suit of armor, that realization would have certainly done so. That wasn't what he wanted to be. That wasn't how he was going to be the best. That wasn't what he would become. No, he resolutely answered. No, I'm not. Inko finally broke a small smile. Good. The smile vanished. Now, your punishment for such unquantifiable stupidity won't be expulsion, tentatively. Any color that might have returned to Bakugo's face drained once again at the mention of expulsion. What do you mean? Because the building wasn't brought down by the explosion and no one was ultimately hurt, the rest of the class was able to continue, just in a different building. That was your only saving grace. You still knowingly tried to commit grievous bodily harm on fellow students during a training exercise, successful or not. This conversation is only happening right now because of pure luck on the part of physics and your answer just now saved you from a one-way ticket to the villain rehabilitation program at Ketsubutsu Academy. Oh, was all he could say in response. Yeah. Oh, in addition to that, you'll be sitting out every heroics class until the sports festival at bare minimum, and you'll be on a probationary period for the rest of the semester in which you will be seeing Hound Dog for compulsory therapy, likely for the foreseeable future. Mess up again, even the slightest misstep, and you'll be lucky to land in general studies. She leaned forward again, and her eyes narrowed into slits. Mess up nearly as badly as you did today, and there won't be a body to send to Ketsubutsu. Are we clear? Bakugo frantically nodded. He was very willing to admit to himself that Inko terrified him, though he wouldn't say so out loud. Good she curtly replied before standing up and walking to the door. I'll inform Principal Nesu of your acceptance of the terms. Let's not have this conversation again. Have you been a pro-hero this entire time? Bakugo called out to the retreating woman. She stopped and stood in front of the door without turning back. I retired shortly before Izuku was born. Was it because of that other pro? She did not immediately answer. It was one of several reasons. Ultimately, I lost faith in heroics. She turned her head to look at him, and she offered him a small smile. Izuku helped me find some of it. With that, she was gone, and Bakugo was left to ruminate on everything that was said. Little did he know, he wasn't the only one. In the bed next to him separated by a curtain laid a wide-eyed Shoto Todoroki. I just don't get how you always know when I'm behind you. Are you sure that super hearing isn't part of your seemingly six-in-one quirk? Ochako huffed as she and Izuku were nearing the gates of Yue the next morning. I think we're at seven-in-one at this point, Izuku offhandedly remarked. And no, you just have to know what to listen for, like the heavy steps of Ida Power walking to school behind us. Ochako turned around in confusion, and, sure enough, Ida was rapidly making his way toward them in typical Ida fashion. She turned a quizzical eye back to Izuku, who only playfully smirked back at her. It also helps to always be listening for something, he added. So, paranoia? she dryly questioned. Hey, a little healthy paranoia is never a bad thing. You never know when your dad might return from the grave to finish the job, after all. What? She did not get an answer or the opportunity to press that alarming detail as Ida caught up with them and attempted to quickly herd them towards their school. 
it was merely an attempt. However, as the gates of the building were surrounded by a sea of reporters, cameras and microphones were being shoved into the faces of any and every student that passed through for the slim possibility that they could get a scoop, update, or any morsel of information on the rumors of all might teaching at the high school. The three friends struggled to navigate their way through the rush of ravenous press until the sight of their homeroom teacher filled them with hope that they'd survive the onslaught. However, through the cavalcade of questions about All Might's teaching status, if he was a competent teacher, or if Lunch Rush's blood was 50% cocaine like the rumors claimed, one particular question stood out to Izuku. Yua claimed to have lifted the restrictions on quirkless applicants and now allows quirkless students to enroll. Is that true? Izuku stopped in his tracks, and he turned to the woman who posed the question. She had pale blue skin, lilac hair, and green eyes with sunken, black sclear. She was giving him a smile that was filled with genuine curiosity, but something about it gave him an inkling of warning in his gut. Well, I haven't personally encountered any yet, but I doubt that anyone who is quirkless would seek to out themselves, especially if they came from a district that was shut down, he answered. He almost missed the slight twitch in her eye at the mention of the district shutdowns, but it was so brief that he questioned if he imagined it in the first place. Care to expand on that? She questioned further without missing a beat. Izuku internally debated on if he should continue the impromptu interview or continue on to class. Most of the other reporters were busy hounding other students and teachers, but he did notice that a scant few had turned their attention to him. Screw it. They came for a story, so let's give them one. Looking the woman in the eye, he spoke. Yes, actually, I think I can speak from a unique position, as I also came from a district that was torn apart and shut down for quirkism and discrimination, and I had the unfortunate situation of being a late bloomer. I spent the majority of my life believing that I was quirkless. Her eyes widened a fraction and the curiosity that was already written on her face seemed to double. A few of the other reporters leaned in closer as well at the development. You were quirkless and still worked on your abilities enough to make it into the hero course? Do go on. I was fortunate enough to have people in my corner to help me achieve my dream, quirk or not. That support was the driving force that allowed me to get to this point, even before I eventually developed my quirk. His expression fell and became more solemn. Unfortunately, not everyone is a late bloomer, and even less people have that kind of support behind them. That's an issue, and either not enough heroes make an effort to address it, or their efforts aren't publicized and don't reach the people really in need. And you want to be that hero? she asked him. You want to be a symbol for the public, similar to All Might? No, not like All Might, he quickly answered. I could never live up to that, and, frankly, I feel like my efforts would be much better served trying to help those that not even all might could reach. Even with a pillar propping up society, people still slip through the cracks. Someone has to be there to extend a helping hand out from the darkness and into the light. So a symbol for the disenfranchised, then, she asked, maintaining her smile that he still wasn't entirely comfortable with. If that's the easiest way to phrase it, then sure, he answered. Well, I'd love to interview you for Shueisha in a few years when you've graduated, she chirped a little too enthusiastically. Before he could respond, a white cloth wrapped around him and started tugging him backward towards the gates of Yua. That's enough of that, you're already late, said a tired and irritated Aizawa. He led Izuku through the gates and walked away from the mass of reporters that were trying find a way around the security system for their all-might scoops. Once inside the building, he turned an annoyed glare to the teen. Why are you talking to the press, Midoriya? The boy in questions sheepishly scratched the back of his head. They wanted a scoop, so I gave them something to chew on that would satisfy enough of them to leave the premises. It cuts down the number of marauders vying for blood out there. The gate has a security system in place for a reason, he tiredly responded. All you really accomplished was shining a spotlight on yourself through the chaos, regardless of the noble intent. You heard what I said, 
Izuku asked with a quirked eyebrow. Yes, and even if I hadn't, it'll most likely be on the internet later today. Now, again, you're late, so get to class. But we're going to the same place, so if I'm late, doesn't that mean you're late too? The long-suffering sigh that escaped the scraggly man's lips was enough for Izuku to dart through the halls and arrive at 1A's door, dodging the reprimand from Ida about his tardiness when he stepped inside. He noticed the smoldering yet contemplative look on Bakugo's face that was fixed downward onto his desk. He also noticed the way that Todoroki looked at him with a mixture of bitterness, contempt, and another emotion that he couldn't really identify. Aizawa entered the room shortly after him, and he addressed the room after they got quiet. Five seconds. Better, but still not great. Anyway, I reviewed the footage from the battle trials yesterday. Most of you did well enough, although there's room for improvement for all of you. We'll be going over them individually later today during your heroics class, and I'll give you each proper feedback then. His eyes fixed themselves onto Bakugo with a glare. I trust you've already been given your official punishment, so I'll only say that if you try anything as monumentally stupid as that again, I'll expel you before Verdant even has the chance to break your limbs. Am I understood? Yes, sir, the teen quietly responded. Bakugo's tepid response shocked Izuku. He wasn't the only one, either, as several others in the room looked just as shocked. He saw that Ashido and even Kirishima were utterly floored. They were probably expecting Bakugo to defiantly bite back or at least have some kind of weight to his answer. Izuku would be lying if he said that he wasn't expecting that, too. He did notice the way that Gyro subtly perked up at the mention of Verdant, though. Good. Now, we're moving on to something that will decide the course of your careers here at Yua, Aizawa began, and the entire class was on the edge of their seats in anticipation for what sort of earth-shattering task was ahead of them. You have to select a class rep. The room completely deflated like a balloon, and the tension was replaced with mild indignation at the dramatic phrasing and genuine excitement for doing something relatively normal. Izuku listened to his class collectively attempt to decide how to go about selecting a representative for about half a second before his brain moved on to other things. Whatever shit he predicted that Bakugo would be in must have been rather severe for him to be so docile. It was pretty disconcerting, if he was being honest. There was also the thing with Todoroki. Prior to the battle trial, while the two-tone teen gave him somewhat contemptuous glares, they were often paired with searching glances, as if he was trying to decipher Izuku like a cryptogram. Today, however, the contempt was diluted in a storm of bitterness, a hint of resentment, and a heap of teenage angst. He wasn't quite sure what to make of that. His attention returned when a slip of paper was placed on his desk and it occurred to him that they must have been voting for class rep. It was a strange way to go about it. He figured that most of the class would vote for themselves given that they all barely knew each other, so any winner would be whoever ended up with two or three votes total. He didn't really care one way or the other. He did have to take some time to decide who to vote for, though. His immediate thought was Ida, as he looked to be the most passionate about the position and would most definitely treat it the most seriously out of everyone there, himself included. However, that may be the exact issue. He was way too intense, and it could be intimidating for many. His next thought was Yayurazu, and he couldn't really find fault with that choice. She was exceptionally smart and probably the most responsible of the class. Even if she wasn't elected to be class rep, She'd almost certainly wind up being vice rep and still bring a ton of value to the role. He put a pin in it and moved on. Ochako was bubbly as all hell, but she would be the first to admit that being class rep wasn't really her thing, and she'd probably punch him for voting for her. Shoji was cool, but he didn't think the taller boy would want the position given his demeanor. He was confident Toru could punch any issue presented to her, so she was an option. Takoyami. What a mad banquet of darkness, he heard the raven-headed boy muttering to himself. Izuku quickly moved on from that thought and wrote Yayurazu's name onto the ballot before placing it in the box. When all the votes were cast, 
Ida went to the board to tally the results. Yayurazu's name received three tallies pretty early on, which he was expecting. He was not expecting to see his name receive a tally, but he wrote it off to being from Ochako or Toru. Then he got another, but he wasn't particularly concerned. Then he got a third, and then he got a fourth. Pretty soon, he was up to seven. What the Izuku absentmindedly muttered. Language, Aizawa called out from his sleeping bag. At the end, Izuku led the pack with fifteen votes. Yeyurazu trailed in second place with four, and Bakugo had a single vote. Izuku was rendered speechless, and he remained speechless even after Aizawa confirmed the decision and the rest of the day proceeded on as normal. He was left to process that thirty-four of his class had chosen him to represent them. How the hell was he going to do that? Why had they even done that? Did they trust him? Why? He felt that Yeyurazu deserved the role so much more than he did. What was he even going to accomplish as class rep that she couldn't? Midoriya? He snapped out of the stupor that he was in for who knows how long to see the woman in question, Yeyurazu, looking at him with mild concern. The classroom was mostly empty. The bell for lunch just rang. Are you well? she asked him. Oh, all right, yeah, I'm fine, he hastily assured. You go on ahead, I just have some things to think about. She nodded, albeit a bit reluctantly, and she left the room. Izuku sat at his desk for a few more moments before he stood and finally began meandering to the door. The second he stepped through the doorway, a hand clamped tightly on his right shoulder, and he was face to face with Todoroki. I didn't need your help and I don't need or want any pity or concern from you, Todoroki spat before Izuku could say a word, and then he spun on his heel and stormed away. Where the hell did that come from? The hell is going on today. Izuku sat down with his food on one of the roofs of Yua. He grabbed his food from the cafeteria and tried to slip out as inconspicuously as he could to an area with very few people. He had too much on his mind from the revelation that he had already made a big enough impression on his classmates to Todoroki's confusing statement in the hallway. He was even thinking about what he told the reporters that morning and if it was the right decision to do so. He still hadn't truly figured out what kind of hero he wanted to be, and while he did want to help the people that just never had the support and opportunities that he was lucky enough to get, he also still didn't think he'd live up to the expectations that would come with that. He was pulled from his musing when he received a text from Yui. I saw you leave the cafeteria after you got your food. I think I know where you are. The roof, right? Do you mind if I eat with you? I don't mind at all. He was about to return to his food until his phone vibrated again. He should have remembered her ridiculous texting speed. A friend of mine from class is tagging along. Is that okay? That's fine. See ya in a bit. He was about to return to his food again, but something she said occurred to him. How do you know I'm on the roof? Because eating on the roof to clear your head is incredibly cliché. Okay, ouch. Am I wrong? He begrudgingly conceded the point and bitterly tore into his lunch, waiting for his friend and her plus one to arrive. After a few minutes, the door opened and out stepped Yui with her usual stoic expression. Bounding out behind her was a girl with long, green hair, and she sported a smile full of pointed teeth. She looked him up and down for a few seconds before shooting him a flirtatious wink, and she could only sigh in both disappointment and amusement when he maintained his blank expression. Satsuna Takaj, Yui spoke up while motioning to the other girl, and then she motioned to him. Izuku Midoriya. Recognition flittered in Takage's eyes, and she became incredulous. So this is the filthy heathen that claims All Might could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Godzilla. Oh my shit, Izuku heaved a sigh. All Might has literally changed the weather with a single punch, and that was years after his heyday. Godzilla doesn't have the feats or durability to compete with an All Might that isn't worried about collateral damage. Are you kidding me? Godzilla doesn't have the feats. Are you seriously trying to power scale Godzilla with me right now? Because you are not ready for that battle. Meanwhile, 
Yui was ignoring the two and watching the scene at the gates of the school. The press was still there trying to find a way inside, but something else grabbed her attention. H.M., she hummed to herself aloud, catching the notice of Izuku who was preparing a rebuttal to Takage's use of charts, graphs, and a whiteboard filled with calculations to quantify the lacking strength of a full-powered United States of Smash against Godzilla's atomic breath. What's up, Yui? he asked. Over there, she simply said, pointing to the ruckus at the gate. You mean the press is still out there? Takage complained with a bit of frustration. Not them. Further down, she clarified, there's someone in a hoodie. The other two looked to where she was pointing to, and they saw the lone figure place his hand on the gate, and the three's eyes all went wide when that section of the gate disintegrated into a pile of dust. He took a step back and waited for the press to notice the new opening, and when they did, they stampeded inside, giving him the cover necessary to slip in with them. You guys saw that too, right? Takage worriedly asked. Hmm, came a more distressed than usual hum from Yui. Yeah, I did, Izuku confirmed with narrowed eyes. He scanned the crowd to find the intruder with the hoodie, but he was interrupted by the alarm going off campus-wide. This is bad, Takich remarked, now more serious than she was mere seconds before. You trying to find that guy? Yeah, Izuku responded. I think I lost him, though. Allow me, was her simple reply before one of her eyes split from her head and flew down to the stampede of reporters. Izuku kept himself from internally fanboying at how cool her quirk was, and he and Yui waited intently for her to find something. Takage's I was scouring the mob for anyone who looked like they didn't belong, and she eventually found her target split off from the pack and step away from view. When a purple portal opened in front of him, she immediately launched her eye after him to not lose him, but he had apparently sensed he was being watched followed, and he turned around and grabbed the eye, decaying it to nothing but dust just as he did to the gate. Shit, Takage swore, he spotted me. Where is he? Izuku questioned. He stepped through a portal or warp gate or something. I didn't get to follow him in, but I caught a glimpse of familiar hallways, so he's definitely in the building. Do we go after him? Yui asked. I don't see why not, Takage replied. We need to at least warn a teacher. Already covered, Izuku spoke up after texting his mom and Nezu about the intruder. Let's find that. And, with a toothy grin from Takage, the three bounded through the entrance to the roof and set off back into the building with Nezu's office as their first stop, as that was where Izuku knew the most sensitive information to be. Reaching the office and not finding anyone inside, the three looked around for any signs of the intruder potentially having already been there. Izuku, specifically, was running over every inch of the office with a fine-toothed comb to find anything out of place whatsoever. Seeing nothing, the three left and continued down the hall to the nearest teacher's lounge. Along the way, Izuku caught a glimpse of pale blue through the small window of a door on his left. Stopping on a dime, he turned to the door and looked through the window to see the hooded man picking up and reading through a small stack of papers. Activating his quirk and lighting up in a flash of yellow, Izuku pushed the door open and launched himself at the man. Time seemed to slow down for even himself as the man was about to step through another portal, but instinctively launched his hand out towards Izuku. Izuku had already seen what the intruder could do with a touch, and he had no interest in becoming dust in the wind. Just before the man's fingers could brush against his chest, Izuku pivoted and dashed to the side to remain clear of his touch. It was all the man needed to leave through the portal, however, and the two locked eyes for a brief moment before the portal closed. Got him it, he lamented. Yo, Midoriya, you in here? He heard Takage call out before the other two entered the room with him. Yui saw the consternation on Izuku's face, and she frowned. What happened? I had him, he sighed. He slipped right through my fingertips. You caught him? Takage questioned. No, I'm pretty sure he was expecting me or anyone else to find him because he shot his hand out at me the second I entered the room, he explained. I dodged to avoid ending up like your eye, and he escaped through another portal. 
Did your eye grow back, by the way? Yeah, I can detach my limbs and control them telepathically, and they grow back if they're destroyed or if I lose connection with them, she explained with a toothy grin. That is so cool, Izuku muttered, and he stopped himself before he could launch into a mutter spree. I know, I'm quite the catch, aren't I? She teased with a pose. Despite your Godzilla takes, Izuku muttered just loud enough for the two women to hear. Oh, don't you start, Takage growled while Yui silently laughed at the interplay. Let's ditch this place before anyone finds out that we practically went vigilante. Izuku's eyes went wide, and he quickly acquiesced. He hadn't actually considered that the teachers very likely would not want him or any students actively pursuing the intruder. What, you didn't consider that when you suggested we, and I quote, find that, Takage pressed with a laugh. Hell, I'm surprised that even Yui went along with it. You didn't strike me as a rule bender. Doing stupid things for the right reasons is the essence of being a hero, isn't it? Yui shrugged. You're goddamn right it is, Takage cheered. I was fortunate enough to have people in my corner to help me achieve my dream, quirk or not. That support was the driving force that allowed me to get to this point, even before I eventually developed my quirk. Unfortunately, not everyone is a late bloomer, and even less people have that kind of support behind them. That's an issue, and either not enough heroes make an effort to address it, or their efforts aren't publicized and just end up falling on deaf ears. And you want to be that hero? You want to be a symbol for the public, similar to All Might? No, not like All Might. I could never live up to that, and, frankly, I feel like my efforts would be much better served trying to help those that not even All Might could reach. Even with a pillar propping up society, people still slip through the cracks. Someone has to be there to extend a helping hand out from the darkness and into the light. So a symbol for the disenfranchised, then. If that's the easiest way to phrase it, then sure. In a dark room nestled within an abandoned apartment sat a noseless man watching the impromptu interview of a UA student very intently. His narrow, red-eyed gaze studied every detail of the video, committing the face of the green-haired teen to memory. Interesting, he mused aloud. Not all might, but being there for those that even all might missed. Very interesting. He sat up, grabbing the bandages that he typically wrapped around his arms and over his eyes. Should we meet one day, I'll test that conviction of yours. After applying the bandages, he grabbed a long, tattered, red scarf beside a freshly blooded katana. And if your conviction doesn't measure up, you'll be purged like the rest of the fakes. So a symbol for the disenfranchised, then? If that's the easiest way to phrase it, then sure. A scoff could be heard from a man with black, unruly hair with a horribly burned body covered in a myriad of patchwork skin grafts and staples. Yeah, whatever, he spat before putting his phone away. You'll burn with the rest. If that's the easiest way to phrase it, then sure. What a disgrace. A young, pure human only turned out to just be more diseased filth, growled a man wearing a stylized plague doctor mask. While he was seething, a little girl huddled in the corner of the room ran some of the things the teen said back in her mind. She didn't understand a lot of it. The words were really big and they talked so fast, but she did understand one key point. A hero for the people even All Might couldn't reach, the people that slipped through the cracks. She didn't know who All Might was, but she was pretty small. Maybe she slipped through a crack and didn't remember. Maybe she slipped through a crack, and that was why she made her dad disappear. Maybe that was why she was cursed. Did she deserve to be saved? She was cursed and a monster, so did she really deserve for a hero to come rescue her from the crack she slipped through? She really hoped so. You're right, get in the chair. Tomura was as still as a statue in his seat at the bar. Kirijiri had taken to wiping glasses that had long since been cleaned as Tamira sat in silence after watching the video from Shueisha. Tamira, is something the matter? called a voice from a monitor. Both Tamira and Kirijiri were at attention at the sound. No, 
the young man responded with a voice almost as dry as his skin. The plan is still good to go. The symbol of peace will die. He paused for a moment, considering his words before speaking. That boy, though, something about him. Ah, there was something vaguely familiar about him, but I could not place it. I will look into it another time, but for now, focus on your current mission of disposing of the symbol of peace, the voice calmly instructed. Tamira looked back at the small screen of his phone, and his thoughts returned to the green-haired teenager. You're the same brat that almost caught me. A hero for those who fell through the cracks, huh? A curious glint appeared in the man's red eyes. Survive tomorrow, and we'll see about that, hero brat. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through What If Deku Unleashed God-like Powers That Surpassed All. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Drip Bayless for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on FanFiction.net for more amazing works. The link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to What If Deku Tuo for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.